Good evening. If you have a mobile phone, if you'd like to put it on silent, please, thanks. Right, please welcome back Adrian Inkledon Weber with Elementals My Dear Watson, working with Nature Spirits. Adrian is a published author, dowser, healer and teacher. He's a former vice president of the British Society of Dowsers and past chair of their Earth Energies Group. Tonight he delves into the folklore of ours and other countries and finds that nature spirits have been known about for millennia. Adrian shares how we can, if we wish, work with them for the benefit of all. Please welcome Adrian Inkledon Weber. Good evening, thanks very much indeed, and uh, great to see you all back here. Um, just very quickly, so I can get it out of the way very, very fast. Did anybody see the Daily Mail last Thursday? No? And oh, that's all right, then good. <laughs> I'm not going to say any more after that. That's it finished, good. I can now start and talk about elementals. Uh, elementals, my dear Watson. Um, I guess as a youngster, I used to really enjoy being outdoors and was very much of a sort of rambunctious um, child. Uh, a sensitive child, but, but loved being outdoors. And people often will say, do you see elementals? Do you see nature spirits? And I, I can quite happily say, no, I don't, but I could always feel them. You know, I could always feel that something was perhaps right by my shoulder and look around and not see anything. So it's kind of really a, a, a bit of a voyage of my discovery over the years. And I try to look at things in a very grounded way, a very down-to-earth way, rather than um, head in the clouds, as the article was last week. Um, I tend to do things in a very grounded way. So we'll, we'll talk through. We have a break at about 9 o'clock, and then we're back about quarter past 9, a little bit more talk, and then we, any questions and answers, or any questions, and hopefully answers, we'll talk about it then. Okay. Really, as far as the elementals and nature spirits are concerned, you know, however you feel about them is probably true. And we'll, we'll talk about why that is over, over the next um, hour or so, hour and 15 minutes. They are very interesting and wonderful creatures to work with. And we'll just show you how as we go through tonight. Let's pop them through. A wonderful quote, we'll be able to read this anyway, a wonderful quote from, he from Einstein. If you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If you want them to be very intelligent, read them more fairy tales. Which I think is fabulous, and I must admit, as you know, Billy Groats gruff as a, as a child, and lots of fairy stories that came through. And to, I would never imagine myself standing up in front of a group of people talking about nature spirits. So let's see what we can do. So, what's an elemental? Uh, the coin elemental was first um, brought up by Paracelsus back between sort of 1493 and 1541. And he looked at sort of the earth, wind, fire and water as the sort of four elements of the planet and then started to look at if you have the elements of the planet, are there any creatures then attached to them? And he then started to look at the sort of fire elementals, the water elementals, and the earth and the wind, and then built up a whole story. He would actually travel around a lot of the Scandinavian countries in particular, looking at their folklore, and then actually coming up with what he felt were the true nature spirits. So you've got the earth, wind, fire, and water, and we will talk about ether a bit later on, which I think is one of the very important uh, elementals coming through. So, spirits of the earth, what are they? Well, we've got the gnomes, which most people have heard about. These little humanoid creatures that live underground. <laughs> Dwarfs live in mountains associated with wisdom and mining and crafting. <coughs> Pixies, yeah, believed to in, uh, inhabit the underground. Trolls, some of my favourite creatures, are fantastic things. They can be quite bad-tempered, which I'll explain as we go through later on. Um, they often live in rocks and caves. Yeah, they can be very dangerous to human beings and also animals as well, which we'll talk about. Now, this is kind of living in caves is, is a very sort of kind of old-fashioned view. And of course, as we move into the tw further into the 21st century, energy patterns are changing big time. 
And the same with elementals, you know, they're not going to stay the same forever. And as we begin to think more about them and actually um, interact with them, so they get more and more strong, well, so they get stronger and stronger and stronger and actually just become part of your lives in many, many wonderful and delicious ways. But trolls we'll talk about in a minute. Um, elves, uh, magical powers, supernatural beauty. We've got uh, fairies, described as humanoid in appearance, often with wings floating around the place. And we've got imps as well. Uh, yeah, attract, not, do you know, as they say, they're, they're not very attractive. Um, I've got a friend of mine who, whose wife actually sees elementals. And she said, they've got the sort of face even a mother couldn't love. So, you know, they're not the most attractive things in the world, but there is obviously beauty in the eye of the beholder. So sometimes you look at them and go, whoa. Otherwise, at times you look at them and go, yeah, they're lovely, helpful creatures and they're just fabulous to have around. And we've got the goblins, um, which again, we've probably heard of, magical abilities. They're quite small, um, but they love gold, they love jewels, anything that sparkles. So if anything, everything, if anything ever goes missing in the house, start looking at the elementals first and foremost. Don't blame the kids, don't blame your wife or your husband. Often the elementals are a bit like the crows, you know, they, they love gold, they love sparkly things, and things will disappear. They do in my house anyway, and it's not dementia, so my wife tells me. One thing I did actually put the slide in today. Um, I've been, with my house healing work, I tend to work for people all over the world. And there's a lovely lady um, called Britt who I'm working with in Sweden at the moment. And I talked to her about troll paths. Her house was built on a troll path um, up in the mountains. They're always having problems. They're always having problems with, with, with running water, whether it's hot or cold. It always seems to block up. Whether it's in the, in the sunshine or in the snow, there's always a problem. The lights always flick up, bulbs blow, and she just felt it was just bad workmanship in, in the house itself, until we started talking about trolls. And as she rightly said, trolls mainly live up in the mountains, and certainly in the Scandinavian countries they, they tend to do so, but they will inhabit forests and they will come down into villages. They're, they're quite inquisitive, quite, yeah, quite inquisitive beings. But she talked about the NISA, or the N-I-S-S-E-R, as people, and that was what she felt was the problem in the house. Now, I'd never come across this. Obviously, when I'm working, and I do try and do a bit of research into the foreign countries that I'm working, whether it's India, um, whether it's in the States, and I'll try and look at maybe what might have, might have happened there in the past, some of their folklore, just to see whether there's anything there that I've actually missed that, that has problem, that why they're having problems in the house. And this is one of them. So, you know, they are very similar to our nature spirits over here, but they do differ slightly in not just their appearance, but also what they actually do. But again, if you upset them, like any elemental, it's a bit like upsetting a bunch of 10-year-old children. You know, you don't go out of the house and leave them to it and say, be good boys, or... Yeah, I will say boys, because girls generally are found on the whole tend to be much more calm. Is that right? Yeah, it is. Ten-year-old boys sit stand, you know, if you've got a group of ten-year-old boys in a house and just leave them to it, they'll be all hell broke loose and, you know, there's going to be stuff broken by the time you get back. And elementals will act very much the same way, as, it, as indeed these do. So they can help in chores, a bit like the... the was it the tailor who'd always come down in the morning and find the, the suits were, were stitched for him um, by, the, by the elves or the fairies? I can't remember the actual tale, but they will help if you ask them to. Spirits of the wind, spirits of the air. Now, I've heard them, you know, if you ever walk up on top of a mountain, certainly the, the big ones I've been to in Scotland, uh, in Tibet, um, in, and into Nepal, you get up there and you can almost, I don't know whether it's me cheering or not from my mobile telephone, but you can often hear the cheers, the, this beautiful noise that comes through. It's almost like a singing coming through the winds. You know, if you... If there's a high wind, you know that sometimes you get the singing from, from the wires, the electrical cables. It's very, very similar to that, but you know, you're thousands of feet up away from all the cables. And you get this most harmonious feel. And it's almost, they're, they're almost joyous. They almost welcome you far more up there than they can do further down onto, onto, the, onto the earth, which is perhaps a little bit more dense. Hang on a minute, is it gonna work? There we are, sylphs. You'll find them, um, really all over the place. They, they are very much there for um, air quality. You can help them or you can ask them to help you clear the air around your house and in your house as well. They operate at night, but even though they take the energy from the sun 
they're always with you, they're always around, and yeah, you can talk to them, and they will talk back. And will o' the wisps. Now, will o' the wisps generally, most scientists I think are now putting it down to marsh gas that explodes, but you can imagine back in the early days, our ancestors, um, you know, we can't really imagine what they thought because we can't put ourselves in their shoes. You know, they, they will have a completely different thought pattern to us today. But you can imagine living near a marsh, uh, living near a swamp, and suddenly finding these, these amazing orbs floating around over the swamp. Yeah, you're going to look at these, the, uh, the spiritual or the nocturnal or the, uh, um, the darker side of things, rather than thinking, oh, it must just be gas igniting as it comes through from the, from the swamp. Air elementals, obviously very similar, we just talked about um, with um, the last slide. So they're vital to our survival. You know, we, we need them in our lives. If they weren't here, to me, the, the earth certainly would be a poorer place. The air would certainly be a poorer place. And if you call them in above the house, they will help. They control weather patterns. Um, I like a game of golf. I'm not particularly good at it because I never play it enough. And with some of the spiritual work that I do with house healing, you know, you're calling on universal energy to help when I'm doing healing on people. So when my, ki my, when my sons come up, who are both much better than I am, I have to work very hard to actually beat them these days. I always ask for the appropriate weather for the game of golf. And I always actually would add the little sort of the, the codicil to say, look, I've been working very hard for you guys over the last couple of months. We're doing some great healing work. I really do need some nice weather over the next sort of X number of hours while we're playing golf. And I don't tell my kids because they all think I'm still. They're getting better, but they think I'm around the twist. So we, we were playing down in Milford in Surrey one day and it was raining, raining, raining. We had a cup of coffee and literally as soon as we walked out the front door, the rain stopped. We played a beautiful round of golf. We got back in within about three minutes, the rain started again. And it happens every time. So, you know, always ask if you've got something happening like a village fete, always just ask for the appropriate weather. That it really does need to be a nice, glorious, sunny day but ask three times, because sometimes they just don't listen the first time. It can be like, I wish it was like this. If you ask three times, generally you'll get some good weather patterns coming through. And yeah, when performing an outdoor ceremony, um, we were doing um, a Spirit and Earth course in Brim and Rocks. I don't know if anybody's been to Brim and Rocks in the room. It's an most amazing place just outside Harrogate, Ripon, that sort of area. It's all sort of millstone grit, but they're incredibly weathered, so they've got these most amazing patterns. We tend to think some of them must be human formed. But we were, we were there doing a ceremony. We, we took a group of people up there to do a bit of blessing around the, around the, the area. And it was raining, it was blowing an absolute hooli. Until we got to the place we wanted to go to, we stopped and said, OK, we could really do with some nice weather now. And within about 30 seconds, the sun came out. And but, but it was the colours on, on the heather that the, all the, the droplets of water took on this amazing glow. It looked like a Christmas tree, all little fairy lights twinkling in the sunshine. It was the most glorious bit. You know, Tim and I, my co-tutor, looked at each other and couldn't believe it, even though we'd asked for it to happen. And the ceremony took about half an hour, half an hour over and done with. I thought, OK, the cloud's coming over, back to the car, and it rained. But it's lovely when this sort of thing happens. It kind of puts your faith back into, uh, back into the, the powers that be. And spirits of fire, so the salamanders. Now, these are probably the most difficult creatures to actually spot. They, they tend to live in the hot spots of the world. You know, the volcanoes, um, hot springs, lava springs. That's where you tend to find them. So they're not good things to actually have in your house. Now, sometimes you will find that they can be get, get trapped in a boiler, so like your gas boiler or your oil boiler. And if you do that, you know, you're going to start finding the engineers going to come around every couple of days with the boiler breaking down once again until they actually find out what the problem is. And there was one lady I was working with and the boiler had gone wrong, I think, probably every three or four days for about two months. And she phoned me up and said, can you do anything about it? I said, well, yeah, I haven't got my Corgi engineer stuff, but I'm sure we can have a go and see what happens. Found out there were a couple of elementals stuck in the, in the water system anyway, one, one water elemental, which we moved, and fire elemental, which is causing all sorts of havoc actually within the boiler. Got the fire elemental moved very, very gently. It started working. 
the engineer came out that afternoon and said, what's wrong with it? Nothing, it's fine now. And he said, how did you do that? Oh, well, a friend of mine moved a fire elemental out of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what's all that about then? So she explained to him, and he sort of kind of nodded and, you know, wandered off, probably scratching his head, thinking, nutter. But we fixed it. So you've got the phoenix, you know, the, the classic um, phoenix rising from the ashes, you know, like a rebirth. I won't say too much because you've just got the heavyweights. Um, as we work our way through, have you ever heard about the, the Kundalini rising within within yoga? Okay, it, it's something that can happen to a lot of people. They, they would probably call it spiritual shock or um, what else they call it? A spiritual or healing crisis, just looking at Carol over there, like a healing crisis. You know, if it happens too quickly, you can suddenly get this, this rush of, of, of healing, this rush of energy belting up your spine and causing you a lot of problems. And in fact, a lot of people have had Reiki attunements at, at Mind Body Spirit Fairs often come back having had this, um, this sort of main problem, this, this, this almost like an awakening within seconds. So, you know, often you'll tend to find that the fire elementals are part of that and need sorting. Now, the best way to find them, the best, best way to see them, if you've got a fire pit at home, light it up at night and get your iPad or get your mobile telephone and just start, start taking photographs of flames. Put them on the computer and then just start looking to see what you've captured because they will move around so fast that you normally can't see what the flame shape is. This is one of them, a little dragon being born, we thought was absolutely beautiful when it came through. And the next one, to me, it looks like a griffin. And there were lots of other, there we had the devil with this pitchfork. I mean, it was quite out, I can't find it, it's at home somewhere, but quite an outstanding photograph. So they are there, but you've got to know how to capture them. But once you've actually seen them, wonderful. And you can really see what our ancestors, you know, they didn't have colour television back in the day, you know, the cavemen days, when they were um, having fires outside. You know, I think they would be able to see these and certainly be able to work with them. And certainly part of you know, starting fires, calling in their help to actually get the fire moving quicker rather than later. And spirits of the water, the undines, um, the sprites. The sprites, the Romans used to do a lot of work with sprites. And you have them um, normally around forest pools, waterfalls. Uh, most of the Roman springs, or a lot of the Roman springs over here, were dedicated to the undines. And this is one that we found when we were walking around Hadrian's Wall a couple of years ago, one of the museums at the far end. A lovely place to go and visit. And they tend to be connected with holy wells and sacred springs, um, anything to do with water. You will normally find a water sprite or an undine. They're both very similar, connected. They bring power, they bring energy, they bring that special feel to, to the water. And also, with, with sacred springs, you know, you've still got the, the, the three um, women that are there, the three ages of the springs. So you've got the, let me just pop in there, so you've got the maiden as, as the spring or the, the holy well started off. As it gets older and older, it becomes more wiser, so you get the, 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 the mother coming through. And then towards the end of its life, and you find a lot of springs have come to the end of their lives, you tend to get the other wise woman, um, the hag, um, who's there just looking after it. If you go to France, top right hand corner is me in France doing some well cleaning or some spring cleaning. That's a terrible pun, isn't it? But, um, but a lot of them, the springs over there, although they had pagan um, origins, were taken over by the Roman Catholics and used in their ceremonies. In fact, there was one village we went to that there was a horrible smell of bleach and they'd actually been down there with bleach to kill all the undergrowth off. And it was just, oh, it, it just killed the, the Holy Spring completely. There was no energy there in any way, shape or form. And of course, you've got places like Derbyshire, with the well dressing, Malvern, and let me go back one, oh, Glastonbury. So you've got the, the Chalice Well, the Holy Well in Glastonbury. Again, it's a very interesting place just to sit quietly and just observe. I think most of us tend to, the problem we have is when, when you get to one of these sites, we just kind of Either if you're, if you're dowsers, you pull out the dowsing rod or the pendulum, or if you're just sightseeing and, and tourists, you just have a quick look, you charge around the place, but you very rarely ever see people just sit quietly and observe and just take in the energy patterns before you then start to do anything else. And so 
the quieter you are, the more chance you have of visita visitation by one of these lovely beings. Well, I think probably the answer's got to be yes to that. If you think what's really, what, what's happened over the years, you know, the, if you look at man, really, we had such a close relationship with, with the ground. And in fact, there was a wonderful book, uh, actually there was a wonderful book written called Homo, uh, called Sapiens, um, by, I think it's called Noel Harari. He was a, he's a Jewish professor of English history, I think from one of the universities, maybe Oxford or Cambridge. And it's an amazing book, how he details man's fall from grace as far as the land's concerned, how that we, we suddenly became trapped by wheat. As soon as we started growing wheat, we then had to actually stop become hunter-gatherers and actually become very much static people. You know, we had to till the soil, we had to plant the wheat, get rid of all the, the rocks to begin with, get rid of all the weeds before we could actually grow it and then harvest it. So we then became static people. And as that went on and on and on, um, you know, we over-harvested the ground as we're, st as we're still doing, and we started to lose touch with the elementals. The green man, I suppose, really was probably one of the last vestiges of, 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 of elementals that we saw carved in churches in particular. Um, it was almost the last stand of the elementals before the church took over. And, you know, obviously now there are more people, I think, living in the cities or, or, or sort of urban living than there are living in the country. I guess, you know, it, it happened probably the Industrial Revolution from the 1700s, 1800s upwards. And then really after the war, we had a massive explosion of people moving to London, Manchester and the big cities. So, of course, the poor elementals are still stuck back in the country doing what they've done for centuries, but with no forethought or no thought from, from anybody else. So, why are they significant to us? Because if they weren't there, I don't think we would be either. You know, we have wasps, we have bees, we have everything on, on the birds that, that, that spread uh, seeds and things throughout the countryside. I think these guys do a similar thing. They're always there, they will always be in gardens, they will be in the fields, they'll be in hedgerows. We'll talk about tree spirits probably just after the break. But they've just been part of us. And I guess with all of this that um, as you look at folklore, you know, these elementals and the nature spirits have been with us you know, through folklore probably since the beginning of time. And I really believe with folklore that there has to be some vestige of truth, otherwise it wouldn't have lasted. So as you start reading through some of these amazing books, and you know, some, you know, I guess with all of them, you know, some of the some of the authors who were perhaps on heroin back in the day, who are on, you know, smoking their pipes, um, who are the guys in China uh, with opium? You know, it's amazing how that would probably start to um, open your mind to greater things. But of course, over here we would have probably something like magic mushrooms. Um, in the States, in Mexico, you have peyote, peyote you know, which I think a lot of our ancestors would probably ingest to really f be able to perhaps leave the, the earthly world behind and then begin to not just see, but be able to talk to the elementals. I don't do any of that stuff. Um, <laughs> the elementals, I think, the more you think about them, the more they'll be with you. We need to have the connection with Mother Earth. I'm not going to say too much about the new book, but it, it's, it's called Spirit on Earth, and it's very much really about man's connection, man and women's connection to the planet. Um, you know, I think most of us are, have, have lost it over many, many years. To keep yourselves grounded, to keep yourselves part of Mother Earth is so, so important. If you take on things like Reiki or in, any of the healing modalities, it teaches you how to connect with spirit. But a lot of what we're, we're taught is purely that, to look upwards. Very few of us actually look downwards. Very few of us ever really, A, you know, we've heard the word grounded, so we try and ground ourselves. But to really sort of actually be in touch with Mother Earth is so, so important. And um, I'm not gonna go too much off, off piece, otherwise my wife will probably throw something at me from the back. Um, we were doing a healing session. We were running um, a group called the, ah, what, what did we call our group? Where did we live? We were living in Dali at the time. Yeah, what's down the road? Uh, a. A. No, uh, no, no, the one we were living in Dali. No, we're, yeah, we're, uh, was it North Yorkshire Healing Group or something like that? Uh, the Dales. Dales Healing Group, there we are, right. It's not difficult living in the Dales, is it really? I should remember. 
Uh, but we were doing this and we had a whole group of healers in there. So we, we used to do kind of healing sessions on each other and talk about this stuff. And one day I said, right, okay guys, what we're gonna do now is to purely do healing from Mother Earth. So forget your connection with spirit. We've got this big lead-lined roof now. I mean, there's nothing gonna come through from upstairs. It's all gonna come through from Mother Earth. And we were using the elementals, we were using the wise women, we were using um, everybody we possibly could from planet Earth to actually help in the healing. Now, interestingly enough, most of the people who were doing the healers on the healies sat down. The atmosphere was incredibly heavy in the room. And when we did a question and answer session afterwards, people felt that the healing took a little bit of time to get going because you know, you're dealing with something that's actually a lot more dense than upstairs. And, but when it did click in, it really was quite astounding how people actually felt. So after about 10 minutes of that, we stopped and we had a cup of tea. And then we connected to the spirit. So we actually put a, a nice lead floor under there. So everybody was kind of used to doing it. We had a few Reiki healers in there and other people who did various forms of healing connected with upstairs. And I looked around and they were all standing. So the, 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 everything had changed. The whole atmosphere in the room had changed. And then when we stopped, quick question and answer session, and then we actually connected with both. And that's when things really, really started to hum. And it was amazing to suddenly find that you had this connection to the spirit world um, through the undines, you know, through upstairs. And then you had this connection with, with the earth as well. Everybody was really linked into the earth. And it was amazing, the sparks began to fly. So, you know, really, we, we've got a job to do on the planet. And, and the elementals are here to help us big time to do it. So never forget to call them in. They will always be with you. But make sure when you've, when you've finished working with them, you thank them and actually make sure they go back to where, they, where they've been. You don't want one stuck in the house. And I'll tell you why a bit later. Okay. I think we all know that probably everything is connected. It doesn't really matter who we are, where we are, what we do for a living. Everything is completely connected. We're all connected in this room. We're connected with everybody outside. It's an amazing world when you start thinking about it. The easy, easiest way of looking at it really is, I, I, many, many moons ago when my, my youngsters, oh God, they're 32 and 30 now, um, had mobile telephones. They had a certain amount of money on them and what they do is drop call you, which I'd never heard of until I had boys. So they'd ring you and as soon as you pick up the phone, they'd, they'd stop. So it wasn't gonna cost them anything. You'd have to ring them up on the mobile telephone. It's gonna cost you a fortune. So what I used to do is, if I wanted them to ring me, I'd just send a little message out, say, right, a bit like the Aborigines in the song lines, they send messages down these lines, and I would do the same with the kids. And within five minutes normally, sometimes a bit quicker, I would normally get a phone call saying, what? What do you mean, what? You want me to phone? I said, did I? Yeah, 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 I just got this, this urge to actually ring you. I said, that's really kind, Alistair, or Charles, whoever it may be at the time. So what do you want to say? Nothing. I thought you wanted me to ring you. No, I didn't. Put the phone down and off we went. So it was just kind of like an experiment to see how you can actually connect. And the same with these little guys as well. So when we interact, you know, we are assisting ourselves. We're also bringing a lot of healing work coming in from these little people. When we connect with elementals, can we see that okay? We can. We're getting energy from them. We're also giving them energy as well. It's a lovely two-way street. And look at that. Isn't that wonderful? The little fairies around the place. <laughs> so, yeah, on a logical level, we need to set the right intention. I think logic is always a very, very difficult, difficult word to use when you come to spiritual matters and elementals and nature spirits. But if you just set the intention to actually connect with them, it's amazing what you'll actually get back. Yeah, especially in the garden. And being in receptive mode, you know, being respectful to them. I think that's one of the biggest things I've learned over the years. Be humble, be respectful, and it's amazing what comes your way. And really, what do they want from us? Interactivity. You know, it, I, I, it was a bit... You know, you often see these, these um, the people on the streets, and they're living rough. And I, I sat talking to one one day, you know, much to my youngest, um, probably disgust, I suppose, at the time, thinking, why are you going to want to get off and do things? And I sat down with him just to sort of try and get on his level to see how he felt. And he said, yeah, we don't always want money from people, but what we really want sometimes is just a bit of recognition. 
people say good morning, but no, I can't, I haven't got any money with me or whatever. And it's the same really with elementals. I mean, it's a weird um, thing to sort of try and bring together. But, you know, you can't really have one without the other. You, you, by, by connecting with them, by talking with them, by even just feeling that they're there gives them a great deal of hope. And I think that hope is a, is a great thing for the planet. I think we all need to live in hope that things will get sorted out in the end. And it's up to us to really help with the raise the vibration of nature. We've got to care for Mother Earth. I think that's one of the most important things that we can do. I know we have all this, this, this sort of plastic issue at the moment. And in fact, as somebody said the other day, you know, even tea bags are made out of plastic. And you look at it and thinking, OK, so I need to go back to actually having loose leaf tea rather than tea bags. Uh, you know, as somebody said, you put them on a, on a um, heap nowadays, um, a compost heap, you go back in six months' time, they're still there, they haven't rotted. So even that is in our food chain now, you know, without... Not, I didn't even thought about it, you know, tea bags must be paper. Uh, no. And the more expensive the tea bags, the more plastic content it's got in it. I know. Uh, yes. So, yeah, working with the elementals raises the vibration in your garden. And we'll talk about this a bit later on, probably just after the break. Sacred sites. Um, I was down in Avebury a couple of weekends ago, and uh, we did this walking... Med Has anybody been to Avebury from here? There's a couple of people. OK. We have this lovely stone row, the Beckhampton Row, coming up to the henge and the stones. And Tim and I wanted something to be a little bit different as we walked up there. We wanted people to actually feel how the ancestors, hopefully how the ancestors felt, a certain bit of it. And so we walked down very quickly and we actually did a, a silent meditation. And it takes about 10, maybe 15 minutes if you walk slowly to actually get back to Avebury Stone Circle. We had a, a seer there, a lovely lady who could actually see the elementals. And she said, it was actually quite funny because as we started off, she said, there were one or two, they were quite curious about what we were doing, you know, kind of looking at us a bit sideways. And as they knew we were just doing a silent meditation, we would connect with the planet, we were going to be doing some healing on the stones where appropriate, you suddenly find one or two more would pop out the cornfields. And suddenly as we were walking up, we had this whole horde of people, the little elementals, following us up. And it, it must have been an amazing sight. I can't see it. She could. But you are, you know, you feel quite joyous when you get to the end of it all to suddenly find these, all these little things bouncing up and down, cheering, waving, and not quite knickers in the air and boots in the air, but it, it kind of felt a bit that way sometimes. You know, they, they, were, they were there, and it's just acknowledging what we've been doing. And, yeah, if you, what, really whatever you're doing. Um, Tim in the book was, um, he's not the greatest craftsman in the world, he would freely admit if he was here. And he was trying to put up some shelves. And I think the typical bit, he got one end up, and then as he was working, you know, the, the other bit fell off the wall, hadn't used the white wall plugs or whatever. So he got on a temper. I think he sort of, you know, probably threw them on the ground and uh, stamped on them a couple of times. And then he stopped. And he said, oh, I wonder if I can ask the elementals for help, you know, whether they help guide me, whether they help calm me down. So we stopped in a five-minute meditation to help. And he said the shells were up within 15 minutes, no problem at all. So he said, it wasn't me. He said, I'm not that good. He said, I'm not pretty good with screws, screwdrivers, anything. So somebody somewhere took pity on me and helped me out. So I said, did you ever douse for it? He said, no, I must do one day. So hopefully next time I come, I can tell you who it was. So really by acknowledging their existence, you know, you've got a certain strength. You're, 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 they, will, they will build up your garden. Um, they will help all the plants, all the trees, etc., in the garden as well. So just keep them in mind when you're out there, and just introduce yourself. Um, Carol did say, why, why do you keep moving every two years? Well, <laughs> I think the neighbours think we're barking mad half the time. Uh, we always go in the garden at a new house, and we introduce ourselves and just you know, tell them who we are, what we're trying to do whilst we're there. Hopefully we'll get their help through, and the neighbours always look over the fence thinking, who's he talking to out in the back garden? And, uh, yeah, so you do get some funny looks. Um, it gives them purpose for their existence. Um, we've just done the folklore a bit. Yeah, interesting, Scandinavian countries. They, will, they employ dowsers in Scandinavian countries to actually make sure if they're building houses, they're not actually built over a fairy path, a troll path, um, any other path, a Nisa path. 
If they find one, plain permission isn't given, so they have to actually move the house away because they know full well they will actually get problems. Now they put fairy doors in houses, they put fairy doors in trees. We've got a few in our in our back garden. Um, it's nice to have, and they do use them. You know, often you go in there and find the doors moved. I know, yeah, people could start blaming the dog or start blaming blackbirds, but I know exactly it's got to be a couple of bunches of fairies in there. And uh, we haven't got any gnomes in the garden. Uh, no, we do actually have one. Alison did buy one the other day. And it's only a small one, but we have our gnome in the garden. In fact, let me just go back a minute. There was a wonderful story. A friend of mine, we were doing some work on her house down in um, Churchdown, just outside Gloucester. And they had a cat called Larry. Well, they still got a cat called Larry, a ginger tom. And Larry was a bit of a hooligan locally, but everybody loved him. I won't tell you what his other name was, but it is in the book. And every now and then he would disappear for four, five, six days, and I get a phone call from Jules saying, he's gone, can you help him? The first time we ever helped him, um, he was attacked. In fact, he, because cats do what cats do in gardens, and dogs do as well, um, the elementals didn't like it. They got very, very upset by him going into not just Jules's garden, but other gardens as well. They become very... Um, um, protective on their gardens. So there were a couple of elementals that would actually wait and actually mug the cat. So the poor cat, she said, you can see him peeping around corners and if there's nothing there he'll charge off and go and stand on the fence. But he won't walk slowly through the garden because he knows what's waiting for him. And we had to actually work, there was one, um, a friend of mine who was a very good animal communicator, tuned into him once and said all I saw was this horrible yucky green colour and he had actually been being attacked and attached by a lawn elemental. Now, I'd never even actually got down to that level. I've got to gnomes and trolls and pixies and whatever. But to actually have individual elementals for lawns and certain trees. And he'd be attacked by one of these and actually attached to him. So, of course, this poor cat was obviously scared to death. Wouldn't come back. So we had to clear the elemental off him. And then she said, within probably two hours, I got a phone call. He's back. A bit bedraggled, but he's here. And then about two weeks afterwards, I got a phone call saying, he's gone again. It was, they've now moved, luckily, so you know, they've made peace with the, with, the, with the elementals there. And we picked up, there was actually quite a nasty gnome in the garden. So she said, what can we do? You know, we, we can't keep, I can't keep bringing you up every five minutes. I said, well, you have been, Jules. She said, I know I have been, but I'm kind of I'm worried about the cat. She said, can we do anything? And I said, I'll tell you what we can do. What's just out your, outside your front door? Is there anything nice? He said, quite a really big yucca there. OK, well, let's work on that. So we actually dedicated the, the yucca to the gnome, who then became known as Gnorman. Now, Jules had always put little, little gifts out for him in the morning or in the evening, little bits of chocolate and little bits of... She did a lot, lot of jewellery, so she'd leave little bits of silver strand, little bits of copper wires and things like that. would always be gone in the morning. And so one day she found them, it could have been a mouse, I don't think it was, but the Norman would always come and actually pick up the gifts. And she said, it's amazing, we've never had a flower on that yucca in the 10 years we've been there, and now suddenly it's got the most amazing flower buds on there, and so it's got to be something that, you know, the Norman is now doing to actually rescue the yucca. Fantastic stuff. Uh, yeah. Well, I guess in some ways it, it almost keeps the memory of the land alive. You know, land has changed so much over the years. Um, we went to come visit a friend of ours down in Pershaw last weekend. And the amount of new houses being built there. Um, when the A3 was built down just outside Guildford, um, the amount of trees that were cut down there as well, you know, you certainly found a lot of tree spirits that actually were then um, misplaced. And lots of people, I suddenly get phone calls from friends of mine who live down there saying, help! All the light bulbs in the house are blowing, we've got problems, the dog's disappeared, the cat's disappeared, the garden's in a mess, what can you do? And it was all these mistraced, misplaced tree spirits that were causing problems. It's a bit like you going home and suddenly you find the locks have been changed on the door and you can't get back in. You're not going to be happy people. And the same with tree spirits, you, know, you kind of get back there and the tree's being cut down, you move to another one, that gets cut down, or there's another tree spirit attached to it. You know, you're not going to be happy, so a lot of problems were caused around that A3 area. And in fact, there were a lot of accidents to begin with, and I think a lot of times, a lot of clearing work's been done down there to appease the elementals, to appease the tree spirits, so that the tunnel now is a lot safer to use.
I haven't found it a problem yet, but who knows. Right, we'll do this just before the break. Now, on the left is my dog, or our dog, Annie. And the right-hand side is a troll, quite well pictured in, in, in folklore. Now, when we first moved to our, the house we're living in at the moment in a little village called Kirby Malzard, just outside Ripon, Alison said, look, can I take the dog for a walk? So I took her down to the playing fields. And we were walking along, and I was with a flingy, so I was chucking the ball down, down the, the, the garden for her, the, the, uh, the green for her. She was running back, and she keep, kept looking off to, the right, off to her right-hand side, my left-hand side. Chuck the ball, as she kept running back, she'd look up, and she'd kind of move across, and then sort of back round to where I was. And we did this four or five times. And I said to her, what, what are you doing? Have you, have you picked something up? Because she often picks up elementals and starts, sits there shivering in a box. You know. So she looked at me and kind of looked over there and looked back at me and kind of looked over there and looked back at me. And I thought, oh yeah, well, I've got this vague outline of this sort of quite large, I guess probably sort of nine, ten feet tall being. So I started talking to it. And you know when you get answers back in your head, you're thinking, I'm either going mad or I can actually um, correspond with this particular person. So I said, Good afternoon. Yeah. He wasn't very talkative. So I said, uh, you OK? He said, yeah. So I said, so what are you? Are you big enough to be a troll? Yeah. Fine, OK, well, I'm not going to get too many answers here. So I got my pendulum out and started dowsing. So what's your name? And I got the, I got the, the, the name back, Norse. I thought, that's a great name. It's a real sort of kind of troll-like name, isn't it? You know, you couldn't find a troll called Fred or Dave or Norman. He's going to be Norse, so that was his name. Uh, so I thought, OK, that kind of gives the game away a wee bit. He's not going to be sort of a happy person, but you know, if I can get him on my side, they're going to be OK. So I said, uh, what are you here for? He said, don't like dogs. Why? Well, you can kind of tell what you know, owners are taking their dogs down there and leaving a bit of mess and not tidying it up. So he said, just don't like dogs. OK, so if, I, if the dog happen, does that and I pick it up, fine. So can I come back? Yeah. And that was about all I ever got from him. But he was this amazing, sort of almost like a guardian of the site that was actually there purely to beat the dog up if, if, if the dog had done anything and actually then also have a go at the owner for not actually picking it up afterwards. So he's still there and I can go down there and the dog kind of runs up and go whoop. No, nope, I'm not going to go over there anymore because he stands over in the far corner, just, just um, not far from the cricket pitch, and it does look a little bit like that. And we'll do that, uh, but another five minutes for... Yeah. OK. The Fairy Bridge in the Isle of Man. Now, my father told me a story years and years and years ago. He was over there, stationed in Jerby for a while, and in the Air Force, he was a ground mechanic in those days. And they'd all troop off down to the local pub in one of those sort of five-ton or ten-ton lorries, whatever they had at the time. And every time they go over the bridge, they say, what do they say to them? Oh, hello, fairies, or good luck, fairies, or, you know, whatever they want to do, fairies. But they'd always say something nice to them. Until one day on the way back, one of the guys in the back said something rather rude to the fairies. And they said they got back to base, and he wasn't in the back of the truck. So they kind of think, where is he? So they had to turn the truck round and actually drive back down. He was about 100 yards away from the ferry bridge. So what happened, obviously, we went over a bump, which they hadn't done. He fell off the back and rolled up into a ditch, almost knocked himself unconscious. And he was there sort of just coming to as, as they drove back and picked him up. Ever since that day, every time they went over the bridge, hello, fairies, hello, fairies, sorry, fairies. <laughs> so, you know, my father told me that many years ago, and then years later he didn't believe in fairies. So thinking... OK, so what's the moral of the story there, then? OK, should we stop there and just have a cup of coffee? Yeah, fine. Yeah. And then we can... Yeah, that's fine. If you... Yeah? As you wish. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. We can do that, and then, fine. Thank you. God, it's warm under these lights, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, slightly. OK. What was our last slide on there? Yeah, the Fairy Bridge, bless them. Um, I've never been, but one day. I've never been to the Isle of Man TT either, which I would like to do one day. Right, sort of starting back with elementals again. 
what do we do with them? Well, I guess with most things we do like it anybody, it's just really connecting with them. It's talking to them, acknowledging the fact that they're in the garden, and also what they can do for you, but also what you can do for them. Um, we're doing a talk, is it the third Sunday, is it John, um, third Sunday of each month, or third? Uh, third Friday of every month. Third Friday. And it's going to be in October. It is indeed. Exactly. So we've got, um, I'm glad it's great at the back, um, we're going to do one called Holy Sites and Sacred Spaces. Now the reason I mention it is in fact when we were doing, <coughs> excuse me, a Spirit and Earth course a couple of years ago, um, we'd actually got this Vesica Pisces and we were laying out crystals and all sorts of things on it, meditating in it. And a friend of mine who's also a very, very good seer could actually see these elementals coming out from the centre of the Vesica Pisces. Now, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. So I think with all of this stuff, the more healing you can do and the more you're um, connecting with them, the more we're going to have on the planet. And the more we have on the planet, the better the crops, the better the growth, the better the trees, the better the air, and everything else. They, they, they are such part of our lives, but we just got to acknowledge them. Can I change the slide? Good. Just keep the pretty ones on. Yeah, I will do, yeah. I was told off the slides were doing too quickly, so I'll slow them down a wee bit, and I'll slow down my talking as well. OK, um, send, them a, send them your approval. I think it's one of the most important things. You know, they are there to help the garden grow. And when you're working with trees and when you're working with plants, I tend to use dowsing quite a lot. So if you ever go and buy a plant, is actually dows for the best place in the garden to plant it. Now, knowing plants, <coughs> a bit like animals, they often will want to be planted in the middle of the lawn, which is obviously not the best place to be. So maybe ask for the second best place for them to be planted. And then once you've planted them, and actually just get one of the elementals, you know, dedicate it to one of the elementals. And once they're there, they'll protect it, they'll look after it, they'll help it grow, they'll nourish it. And it's amazing how you're certainly getting them at this, this growth spurt that comes through and you know it will actually be a lot healthier than, than any other plant in the garden. Now I tend to do experiments you know I can talk about this until the cows come home but it's quite nice to do experiments and we had um, a, a, when Alice and I first got engaged you know, when we got engaged we didn't get engaged a second time when we got engaged mum-in-law or my future mother-in-law gave us a pair of roses I think from Marks and Sparks wasn't it? Yes? If you yeah, there we are. You call the back up and look what happens. <clears throat> These two roses. And so Alison was at work and I was sort of not at work and I was doing what I do now. So I planted the two roses. As I planted mine, it went in really, really well. Not a problem, planted, watered, perfect. When I came to plant Alison's, it, I got a, a thorn right in the finger and it really, really was quite nasty. The thorn broke off. And I kind of wasn't overly happy with the rose, and I won't tell you what I said, um, but it wasn't very nice. And about six months, well, less than six months, so a couple of months later, mine was this beautiful rose that came out in flower, and Alison's was this horrible, wilted rose that didn't do much, did it? I did apologise to it, but it just shows you really that, you know, when, when I called in the elementals to look after mine as well, I didn't do that for Alison's, because I actually didn't like the rose, and my finger kind of swelled up to twice the size until I managed to get the thorn out. So just be careful what you say to plants. It's a bit like children. If, the more you nourish them, the more you um, say how much you love them, how beautiful they look, you suddenly go, wow, you've got this lovely child. Not, not always a lovely child, but in most cases, you've got a lovely child on your hands. And the same with elementals, the same with, with the nature spirits in the garden. Hostas. Who? Hostas. My hostas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, actually quite a good point. Um, I always look at people's hostas to see how many... Um, how many chews there are out of it, whether it's ants or whether it's slugs or snails, you know, how many holes there are in the leaves. <coughs> and then I go back and look at mine and I haven't got any. I tend to um, put a protective ring around my hostas, but I also make sure that I've got a couple of elemental standing guard just to make sure that no snails or slugs get on top of them and actually start eating the leaves. And every year they've been perfect, haven't they? And they're flowering, I think, just about now, aren't they? So, you know, you can ask for protection. These things, uh, the, the elementals will actually be there, and I kind of picture my two, but like the beef eaters, you know, they're both there with their tridents, and every time a slug comes along, got it. 
I do send love to the slugs and the snails as well. <clears throat> but it, you can actually rid your garden of slugs and snails and also your house of spiders if you want to by just partly talking to them, but also changing the energy patterns. Not necessarily making it detrimental for the spiders or detrimental for the slugs and snails, but making it less beneficial. Almost putting it down to like a neutral energy pattern that they don't like. You know, obviously we all absorb energy, we all absorb good energy, sometimes bad energy, but mainly good energy. The more you absorb, the better you feel. That's like a baked beans advert, doesn't it, really? The more you eat, the better you feel. Let's have beans with every meal. You know? But the, the more you can absorb, the better it is. And it's the same with these. You, you just change the energy patterns to make it less beneficial and make it more beneficial in your next door neighbour's garden. So you can see the, all the slug trails going across into the neighbour's garden and have a look over there, see everything being eaten. But our garden's fine. No, I do look after the neighbours as well. I try and send them over, over the road into the field. How to work with them? Okay. Talk to them is the most important bit. You know, forget the next door neighbours if they think you're mad. Talk to them. If you're not sure if they're listening to you, who, who douses in the room? Does everybody douse, know how to douse, use pendulums? I know a few of you do. There's a few hands going up, one or two. Just find out what they're looking for. You know, are the elementals in the garden happy? Yes, in ours they are. Um, are they in your, in your garden? No, they're not. What do you do with your garden? Have you cut your lawn recently, or are you not looking after it properly? Me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, cut me long. Yeah. It's got, it's got horse tails in it now. Ah, right. <laughs> now then, I did talk to a friend of mine who had a weed-free garden. <clears throat> I said to him, how the hell do you keep the weed, uh, you, all the weeds out of your garden? He said, I just tell them to bugger off. And I got outside and bugger off, and he said, they go. Now, I've never tried it. You know, Alison's the, the gardener in the family, but you know, it is quite good to be able to invoke some of the elementals to actually be able to do that for you. So, go back and have a word with them. Yeah, be first law. Okay. Right, okay. So, get, get a few elementals dedicated to it and to get them to actually look after it for you and be a lot happier. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's all about communication. As all life is about communication, you know, you walk down the street and not talk to anybody, you rarely ever find anybody talking back to you. You walk down, with a smile, walk down the street with a smile on your face, they leave the smile back at you or you'll get locked up, one of the two. But they always say a smile goes around the world, so you smile at somebody, they smile at you, the person behind sees them smiling and smiles, and so it can drift around the world. So, the elementals, that's what they do. Look after the flora, look after the fauna. Now, you will get them trapped in your house, and all I just do is make sure they're moved very discreetly, very carefully back into nature. And I'll tell you how to do that in a few minutes. When you're out in the garden, yes, talk to them, but tell them what you're going to be doing. So, if, if you're cutting um, a branch of a tree, tell it why you're doing it. Now, you know, we've all probably heard stories about you know, people coming back from Afghanistan or over the years with, with a leg blown off, one arm blown off, or even missing a finger. You know, they will still have that itch that they just can't get to on their elbow, even though the arm's being chopped off here. So, you know, if you cut off a limb of the tree, the aura is still surrounding that limb. So it's, in reality, it's still there. <coughs> so if you just talk to the tree, tell it what you're doing and why you're chopping it back. If you're going to get rid of it, then fine, just say, look, you know, you're in the wrong place. If there's a tree spirit there, we'll move you on to another tree. But if you're cutting some limbs off, tell it why, and then just ask to it to be repaired afterwards so the aura actually fits around the, the, the new tree rather than leaving it as it was. Because it's still going to be putting all its energy into growing the branch that isn't there anymore. So it could be hundreds of feet away, but it ain't going to get any better. And, yeah, this is quite an interesting one. Has anybody ever heard of Cleve Baxter? Okay, you have. Okay, I was about to say, for the geeks out there, Cleve Baxter was, I think, MD or CEO of IBM. So a very, very important guy in the computer industry. He was fascinated by plants, and he wondered to himself whether they actually had feelings. So he wired one up to what they said on there is a, a galvanometer, which is basically a lie detector. And um, 
yeah, sorry, he was a, yeah, also part of the part of the CIA. So he wired these plants up with this with this um, lie detector, and as he walked towards it with water to water it, so that the, the detector would move in in a nice pattern. If he walked over there with a pair of scissors then suddenly the, the, the flower or the plant would go completely wild off the scale with, with total stress. <clears throat> and he wondered really how far this phenomenon would actually stretch. So he wired this plant up and put the uh, crocodile clip on it or whatever he connected it to. And he was over in Paris or somewhere, you know, a couple of thousand miles away from the States. And actually in his own mind said to the plant, right, when I come back, I'm gonna get a knife and I'm gonna cut you down and you will not be living any, any longer got back to actually find that this plant had actually gone berserk from several thousand miles away. He also did apologise to the plant when he actually burnt its leaf, because that's the, the reaction he wanted to get to see how, how bad it was, and it wasn't very nice. So if you can, there's a book called The Secret Life of Plants, um, which you, I don't think you can buy new anymore, but you can certainly get it secondhand from Abe Books, which goes through all this, in you know, how he was so, so interested in what plants gave off. And I think also that there's a place called in northern Italy outside Turin that do a lot of experiments with um, uh, le uh, trees and plants and things and they've now actually invented a machine that actually um, plays the actual sounds from trees so as you start talking to it it will actually respond and they've now actually got the actual noises that the trees make as they respond to your voice which uh, it's not cheap it's, it's, it's several thousand pounds but you know, we're beginning to now connect with Mother Nature in ways that we never thought we could. So yeah, willing to believe. I mean, if before you came tonight, who actually believed in, in nature spirits? A few people. Do people, are there any more now that actually do believe in nature spirits? How do we, okay. Well, a couple more, okay, okay. I think willing to believe is quite a good one. It, it's a bit like the science thing, you know, you've got to see to believe it, but what about if you believe it, you can then see it. So just turn it around a wee bit, so you believe, you see, rather than see and believe. Children. You know, children in most cases are, are in the now. You know, they're, they are here, they're thinking about what's in front of them. But most adults don't, you know, we're, we're thinking about a Sainsbury shopping trip or we're thinking about getting home or what we're doing next week or the week after or holidays. You know, we are very rarely as, as adults in the now, but children are. And they believe. And as you believe, you know, it's amazing what will come to you as you start working with these, these beautiful spirits. And, you know, they believe in angels, they believe in all sorts of things. And you can see the look on their faces when you start reading the books about angels how they start to look, and it's, it's almost like they've been visited by one. So with all these, really, the more you believe, the more you will see, and the more you will hear as well. I'm not a great seer, but I do hear, and I also do feel when they're around me. Yeah, scepticism. It's good being sceptical, and I would say that I am sceptical about all sorts of things until it's proved to me that it, it works, and then I just lose my scepticism. Close-mindedness is not a good way to be. You can't afford to be these days. Uh, yeah, if you, can't see, if you can't see something, how can it exist? Well, it does. Uh, you know, they said at one stage, space is filled with nothing. Actually, it is filled with matter, but it's quite dark and you can't see it. So all of a sudden, you know, Professor Sir so-and-so and so-and-so many years ago who said nothing exists in space is now completely wrong. So I think with science these days, you know, if you look at the quantum side of science, so I'm not going to get into because I really don't understand it, which probably means that I do, or do I? I don't know. But, you know, quantum science now is coming up with some amazing theories, uh, not proven yet, but we'll have to wait and see what happens over the next few years. And, of course, you've got quantum biology coming through as well, which is going to bring up some surprises. So, how can I help you? Right, OK, they'll give you guidance. Yeah, a weed is just a flower in the wrong place. Um, you probably can't say that to mares' tails or horses' tails now yeah. because <clears throat> they're everywhere. They are, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, there was I was down, yeah. When I lived just outside Guildford a few years, ago, well, many years ago now, I, I was talking to one of the guys from uh, Ripley, the National um, N not NHS, RHS, Royal Horticultural Society's Gardens down there. They're very similar to um, Harlow Car in Harrogate. And he was down there and he said there, was, there were two ladies walking along chatting to each other and uh, 
You see, I'm always used to people actually asking me for cuttings and things which we can't give. And she looked down and said, oh, do you mind if I take some of those cuttings? And he said, yeah, of course you can. Mare's tail. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually medicinal silica, they are. Is that right? Yeah. You can do things with them? Yeah, you can. The medicinal silica, you can make silica out of them. Wow. Three joints. Hmm. So how do you do that? Ice cream. Really? All right. Ah, so we need to get cuttings of mare's tail in our garden then, do we? Take yeah, mine. <laughs> I'll be around later on. Yeah. yeah, so there's always two two perfect places to plant your shrubs. Uh, you know, you don't necessarily want them in the middle of the lawn. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's amazing. When I first started doing this work, um, yeah, um, there, there's a big house I was working on in Godalming. I don't know how many millions of pounds it was worth. I was a bit nervous because it was kind of my first foray into professional house healing and uh, after about sort of three or four weeks I went back to the house and uh, the lady was kind of really very much in, in tune of what I, what I was doing and the husband said to me he said how does this house healing work and I said uh, I'm not sure really it's it's universal healing and it no he said no no no, no that rubbish he said, I don't care about that stuff he said what am I supposed to feel in a house and I said, well, your office should be feeling a lot warmer and brighter. That feels much better. Um, I said, you know, you, you should be feeling, um, I don't know, there's a couple of things I said. But I said, that funny smell you had in your, your um, airing cupboard upstairs, probably is gone now. He said, yeah, 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 gone. Within a couple of days of you working on the house, the smell disappeared. What was it? A trap gnome. So a gnome had got into, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. By this stage, he, he was kind of uh, almost wrapping his fingers on the table, thinking, is this guy an idiot? Or what? He said, I know full well that the house is feeling better. He said, you know, I, I think I said to him, you and your wife will probably have a better relationship. Oh, yeah, we have a much better relationship. We're not arguing quite so much. Good, OK. So he said, mm. he said, difficult to actually put my finger on it, but gnomes in my own cupboard? He said, oh, I can't really work with that. I said, do you want me to put him back? No, 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 no. So I'm quite happy, happy with my airing cupboard the way it is now, fine, no smell, nothing at all. And basically, no one had come in, his wife was a, a wonderful gardener, had come in with her, prancing around her feet during the day, into the house, got trapped, found his way up into the airing cupboard, and that's where he sat, fuming. If you ever get a smell in the house you can't quite trace, you'll probably find it's going to be a trapped elemental. It's kind of like an off-meat smell. If you've ever walked into the countryside and disturbed a deer, you get that very musky, kind of, it'll be a bit like a fox as well. It's that very musky kind of off-meat smell. That's how a trap known smells. They're not very nice people to have in the house. I tend to find with all this that, you know, with, with most of my life, it, it's, as I was saying a bit earlier, to be sceptical until something's proven. And I just moved into a house in Godalming, renting, before I moved again a couple of years later. And I decided to have my um, office upstairs, so at least I could see something out the bedroom window. Because as my son said, he said, Dad, your wheelie bin goes out more than you do, so you do need to get out a bit more. Fine, OK. So I sat upstairs, so at least I could see people walking outside the front of the house. And I was in the office, so I, we'd, we'd moved in, it had been empty for about six, seven weeks. And there was always this horrible smell in the office. So my son used to walk past and say, Dad, you need to change your diet, excuse me. So when he says, me, I don't do this sort of stuff. He said, it's a horrible smell in there, you know, really need to get yourself sorted out. Go to the doctor or something. So I thought, OK, this is kind of weird, you know, there must be some, is there something trapped in here? Yes. So I'll be looking at which of the elemental, earth elemental, yes. And so I ran through my list, it was a trapped gnome in my office. And it had been there for at least six, seven weeks whilst the house was empty and I was having a great time, party time in, in, in Midsummer Road in Godalming. The other elementals had all moved out, but this gnome was not going to move out. As far as he was concerned, it was his house and not mine. So, I, you know, the, 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 more, the, the, the worse smell he could produce, the more chance I have of me moving out. And I wasn't going to move, something had to give. So I started to do some dowsing work saying, can I actually get him out of the house? Yes. So can I get him back into the garden? Yes. OK, is there something I really need to do to actually get him out of the house? Yes, there is. Uh, so is there something in the garden that he's particularly drawn to? Yes. Back garden? No. Front garden? Yes. So I walked out there with my dowsing rod and said, OK, show me whereabouts in the garden this particular plant is 
And it wasn't far from the front door, just to the left-hand side of the front door. And it was a beautiful... Um, what are those little fruits that turn into those most amazing flowers that look like alien spaceships? Uh, no, passion. Uh, passion flower? That's, yeah, that, they're the most amazing flowers, aren't they? Yeah. So it's a passion flower in full bloom. And that was his favourite plant. So I went back upstairs and I sort of picked up my mobile phone or my cordless phone and pretended to phone a friend up and said, guess what, I tell you, we've got the most amazing passion flower in my front garden. So I kind of, what, what often used to happen is my, my hairs would stand on end when I knew something was going to happen. So my hair stood on end and I thought, God, I've got this attention. So I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll go down there and get a photograph of it and I will email it to you, but it, it is stunning. So I wandered downstairs and I kind of felt this little presence screen bump, 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 bump downstairs behind me. So I sort of went outside the front door and just outside the front door and I thought, has he, has he gone through? Is, is, he, is he in front of me? Yes. Right, a quick sort of whoop, quick boot up the back side, shut the front door and I said, right, round the corner, that's where the passion flower is. And I said, look, you've got to dedicate yourself to that. It really is now down to you. You are the guardian of the, of the passion flower. And there it flowered for months and months and months. Even when we got into winter, this thing was still flowering and people were coming up and saying, how do you do it? I said, bah, it's the gnomes. Oh yeah. <laughs> I had to move a couple of months afterwards because you've got some funny looks from people all the time. But it's that sort of thing can happen inside your house. If you ever have a problem, give me a call. Yep, happy gnome. Yeah, look at those. Fantastic. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in fact, there was, was it in Aldi's or somewhere? Uh, one of them, or maybe maybe Morrison's I walked into, and I talked about the Gnorman story. The actual gnome they had on there was about that high, called Gnorman. Oh, I was going to buy it, but no, my wife told me not to. And I do listen to my wife all the time. <laughs> so, connecting with them, we kind of get this, this different feeling. You know, we're, we're connecting back to the planet. We're connecting back to something that's, that's, if you like, in our DNA. Emotional level, something changes. And our connection to the subtle realm, you know, we, we, we do connect with spirit, and that's kind of what we're being told to do all the time, whether it's from a religious point of view or if like a spiritual point of view. But to connect with Mother Earth, to connect with the elementals is something very, very special. And if you look at the book, by, by connecting, the, the brain does do different things. And we've done a lot of experiments with a mate of mine who's a clinical neurophysiologist down at Exeter Hospital. He wires people up who have had epilepsy, um, bad dreams, and you know, can't sleep. He's, he's the expert. So we've got quite a few experiments in there that actually shows what happens when you begin to connect to spirit, connect to the earth, and actually start connecting with the elementals. Things do begin to change in the brain. So gratitude, yeah, or the attitude of gratitude, I think as, as a friend of mine says, just be grateful for what they provide you. And yep, beautiful lawns. You can do that quite easily by just talking to them. Um, tell them when you're going to cut the lawn and why you're doing it. Um, as we've seen, seen with the cat, they can become quite territorial. They don't like animals doing what animals do on the lawn. Unless you go and tidy it up, in which case then you get a smile and you get a much better lawn. But they don't like it a great deal. And yeah, just to make sure, because Annie, the dog, unfortunately used to charge out every morning when we lived in Dali and um, would charge out straight into this bush where the elementals stayed. And I always picture these cups and saucers and tables and little gnomes go flying. And she'd always come back shaking. So she'd lie on her bed and go, mm, little pathetic wretch. You know? Typical Springer Spaniel would never be told. So every day I had to do a clearing on her, get the elementals out, put them back in underneath the bush, and actually apologize to them. She never really got it, did she? Bless her. Um, and these ornamentals, um, on ornamental ponds, if you've got a pond in the back garden, just make sure you've got the undines, you've got the, 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 these lovely water spirits actually in there. They will help oxygenate the pond, they will help the fish, and if you program them properly and talk to them properly, they can even keep herons away. How's that? Uh, yep, bring life into the pond. Um, the earth elementals will be there too. Tree spirits. Has anybody here ever hugged a tree? A few people, okay. Did you get anything from it? Yeah, okay. It's amazing how tree spirits will help trees grow, survive, and become plentiful. If you give a tree a hug, 
it's always worth asking the tree first before it, if, if it wants a hug, because you do get some bad-tempered trees. You know, it depends what's been going on, but what the squirrels have been doing, what the woodpeckers have been doing, you know, they, they can become quite ungrateful sometimes. So I always, it's a bit like if you're walking down, down the high street here and somebody came up and gave you a big hug that you didn't know, you're thinking, well, who's that? It depends on what they look like, I suppose, doesn't it, really? But you kind of wonder what, uh, who it is. And the same with trees. So it's always worth, if you can, ask the tree if they're happy to be hugged. And then just see what happens. You'll, you'll be able to give healing to the tree and the tree will be giving healing to you as well. Yeah, so most elementals uh, or tree spirits, they tend to be tree specific. They will be with one tree until the end of the tree's life. If the tree's dying, they will skip. Um, sometimes if a tree's been cut down, uh, the tree spirit will actually move from log to log to log or from, from um, plank of wood to plank of wood to plank of wood. So it really depends. If you're the poor person that goes into the, uh, into, um, the hardware store and buys that last plank of wood with a tree spirit attached to it and take it home, you can have problems in your house. And the same with the trap gnomes. The deities are recognised worldwide. Um, the Bodhi tree in Bodhgaya, where the, the Buddha gained enlightenment, um, they're saying there with the tree spirit, the leaves are always moving, even if there's no air, there's no breeze, no wind, the leaves are always moving due to the tree spirit. I've never been there, one day I'll get there. And if you look at it from a, from a druidic point of view, trees are very much like us, you know, very much that connection between Mother Earth and the sky. They've got the roots in the ground and they've got the leaves in the air. And it's a bit like us, they become that conduit. So the more that we can plug into Mother Earth and we can plug into upstairs, we'll be doing healing both ways. We're getting some healing ourselves, we're also doing some healing on the planet. And with healing, you ask permission to make sure they're happy with you approaching them. Ask which is the best side to sit, because all the trees will have different areas and will give different healing to different times to different people. Yeah, they can get upset, but most cases they're okay. If you ever want to see a tree spirit, the easiest way of doing it is start looking at the canopy, looking at the leaves, and just start dropping your eyes down very, very slowly until they stop. They will stop naturally and then start to, look, look, uh, start to concentrate on what you're actually looking at. Now, the best way to do it is, do you remember those 3D things you used to get in the backs of magazines? You could actually look through them and there'd be an image in that, in that sort of weird 3D pattern. Do you remember? Uh, they stick out. The same with these. If you just hood your eyes and just kind of shade your eyes a wee bit, you'll suddenly start to see maybe a slight sort of pattern in there or a bit of haze. That's where the tree spirit will be. And there's always one on a tree in most cases. And you can douse if you wanted to, to verify the fact. It's very easy to walk with a pendulum in your pocket. And just tune in. Send it love, send it good wishes, and it will actually send the stuff back to you as well. Yeah, patience is a virtue. So how to work with them? Be calm, relaxed. Ask them, talk to them. Introduce yourself. Become aware of changing sounds. It's amazing when you just sit very, very still and listen you begin to become aware of different sounds. And okay, it may be a, a blackbird turning over the leaves, but you might suddenly find there's no other animals around and suddenly nature spirits will be there. You'll start to become aware of them. It may be a bit like a cobweb. You know, when you, when you walk through cobwebs, you kind of get that funny feeling over your face. That can sometimes happen with, with nature spirits. So just be very aware of feelings and the sounds around you. Expand your aura. If, if anybody here is a healer will know about auric fields, try to expand your aura to actually encompass not, ju sorry, encompass not just the tree, because the tree will be encompassing your aura, but also any elementals that are around you as well. And start the healing process. Ask for energy patterns from them and give them energy as well as you go through. You kind of merge with the tree. And if you can sit in its roots, even better. And then, if you're lucky, the tree will start to communicate with you. But that does take time, it does take patience. And, yeah, intent and good heart is one of the most important things to have. Amazing, isn't it? So, how just to finish off, how to help them, connect with them, begin to ask questions. And I tend to do this in the earlier stages with dowsing. I just get messages now coming through. Just find out, are they happy in the garden? 
If they're not, find out why and what you can do to help by asking questions. Send healing. I think most of them will accept healing whether you've got, you feel you've got their permission or not. Just send them lovely white light or whatever colour light they might need. It's going to help them big time. Does the tree have a guardian spirit? Sometimes they do. But just be very careful if one does, because sometimes they just don't want you actually approaching the tree. Um, I've got a couple of minutes. There was one big tree that I found um, in a churchyard down near Newbury. And it was, I, I can't even remember what tree it was, but it was the most magnificent looking tree. It just kind of stood there loud and proud. And I walked up to it and all I heard was, don't you dare come any bloody closer. And I kind of looked around thinking, where did that come from? Pardon my language. And I started to walk towards the tree again. He said, I've just told you, don't come any closer. It's a beautiful feminine voice. And the tree was there. And as far as the tree was concerned, you know, I wasn't allowed to do any healing. I wasn't allowed to approach the tree. Look, but don't touch. So if somebody had actually walked straight in and actually given the tree a hug, they probably would have got a shock or something, or they would have taken something away that the tree would have given them, and it wouldn't have been very nice. Does the tree need pruning? If so, talk to it. Tell it why you're doing it. Does it need protecting? Just ask to make sure any elementals around are protecting the tree and looking after it. Especially during the, during the, the winter months, when you know, obviously it's susceptible to frost, just ask that a protection be given to it. And does the ground around the tree need healing? It's amazing when you start looking at trees how you can start seeing one or two that, in an orchard for instance, they're all looking very healthy apart from one. It's often worth doubting to see whether there's an earth energy line or a water course going underneath it that it doesn't like. And the same with us as human beings. And does the tree need grounding? Sometimes they do. You know, they've been planted, but they haven't been planted perhaps deep enough. Just ask that the fact that, you know, the, the, the roots grow and, you know, they start, the, the, the Mother Earth will nurture the trees and the elementals will help. And, yeah, does the tree in a spirit, because sometimes you'll find a tree perhaps hasn't got a tree spirit that just needs connecting with one and they just ask for it to happen. The future, just very quickly, we've talked about the four elements, earth, wind, fire, water. We're now beginning to find etherical or etheric elementals coming to the planet. Now, if you look at it from a Buddhist point of view, ether's been known for years and, and talked about for many, many years as one of sort of the missing elements, but very much a healing element. And we're now beginning to find etheric elementals coming to the planet. There we are, just getting the buzz coming through now, so I'm not talking rubbish, thank you. Um, so as, as they come through, they're a little bit like, if you believe in archangels or angels, they're kind of guardians of the, of the human race, they're guardians of the planet. The etheric elementals are coming through as guardians of the, of the actual earth, wind, fire and water elements. So they've got these huge protectors coming through because they just need that extra help. And they come through not as orbs, it, it's, it's because a lot of orbs tend to be probably spirit or they tend to be perhaps flashes of light. They're coming through as spheres of light. These, these do have total form to them and totally different colours inside. So if you've got a photograph on a camera with an orb, just to make sure if it's got form to it, the chances are it's an etheric elemental coming to the planet. They're here to help us, they're here to help the planet, so hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be here in a couple of thousand years. If you're interested to receive a newsletter you know, it could be on any subject during a court, probably one a month come through. I wake up in the morning, I'm often given a title to actually write a newsletter on. That's all I'm ever given. They don't actually tell me how to type it. But if you're interested in getting a newsletter and course details, then sign up to the uh, your emails through my website and I'll be able to send one through for you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is all about nature spirits. This is, this is where I ask for any questions and hope I can answer them. Anybody got any questions? Um, yeah. When, when did you become a house healer and how did you get into it? When did I become a house healer? Um, probably about 14 years ago. Um, just very briefly, Kay, I, was, I was, had my own estate agency business down south and came across these divorce houses, houses that would come on the market every three years almost to the day with a happy couple having bought from a divorcing couple, getting divorced now, and so it went on for 25, 26 years. And I've been doing quite a lot of healing towards the end of my time running the business. 
and it was a choice of either continuing the state agency or getting full-time into healing so I thought forget the state agency I don't want any more stress in my life I say um, so I then started doing doing dowsings doing healing work and it then kind of morphed into healing people's houses and people as well you know you have to do you have to work on both to get them into balance so it's been about 14 years now but but real serious stuff about 12. I'm never quiet touch wood um, there are so many millions of houses over the planet and I've never found one yet that hasn't had a problem whether it's ghosts whether it's energy lines water courses uh, whether the people have attachments or, or emotional stuff that's you know if like blobs of energy attached to them over the years um, everybody needs work done yeah every house I've moved into has needed work um, Sometimes I leave it a little bit late and do wake up headaches every morning and not feeling too good and then think I better do my house. So yeah, it's been a, a voyage of discovery over many years. Okay. But the elementals are great to work with. Yes, right at the very back. Um, when there's a very bad situation, as with the fracking, yep. um, is there any way of actually asking the elementals to come in? I mean, I've done lots of praying about it, but I've and there's been lots of problems on the site, which is great. Yeah, fracking is, is, is a difficult one. I, I do tend to have fracking as one of my questions I ask when I'm working through house healing. I don't come across it very often. I found one case recently just outside Beverly in Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't actually fracking they were doing. It was actually the, 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 all the, the seism, seismic tests. So I do always just call in the elementals to help with, with any healing that needs to be done to the planet also send healing to the people working on the site and I also send healing to the people who actually own the company so what I then try and do is almost put them in it sounds sort of very easy but in a bubble of white light but put mirrors on the inside so that they begin to see themselves as other people see them so hopefully they'll start to look inward at in fact some of the damage they're doing to the planet um, they, I, I don't think it's going to be as bad here as it is in the States where you know fracking is all over the place I think it's probably carried out in, in a better way here, but it's been done in this country for certainly the past 20, 25 years that I know of through a friend of mine who, who uh, a friend of a friend, here we go, sounds like sort of, you know, conspiracy stuff, but certainly a lot up in Scotland, um, some of these pathways that disappear into the wilds, a lot of fracking being done up there without public knowledge. So you can do a lot to help. You can do a lot to help Mother Earth. But at the end of the day, Mother Earth, you know, the Earth will still be here even if we're not. But I do believe that the, the Earth is here for us, not the other way around. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? I did. Um, yeah. it's, it's slightly as an aside. Uh, I went down to the uh, frack camp uh, yesterday and uh, I dropped some wood off. We get wood now and again. It's twisted wood and you can't sell it. And I've got an account that this one of the builders made. So you can't give it me. <coughs> Just for you know, ten pound in charity uh, box, and uh, they give me, they gave me about half a ton of this one. Huh. So I dropped that off, and I sat. I was having a brew down there, at that Maple Farm. I dropped it off at New Hope actually, and uh, anyway, I sat down with uh, this this fellow from Warrington, which is where I was from originally, and um, he was telling me Pete Marquis, who was work actually doing work for Quadrilla and uh, supplying uh, labour and knocking down the uh, towers at the gates and the like. Yep. Um, the planning of uh, a frack well or a frack test not far from his house, he's only put an old frack sign in his house. Well, that was quite ironic, really. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. I think the trouble is, you know, um, money money works doesn't it for a lot of people yeah. and you know I think this day and age there aren't, aren't that many jobs going around so people kind of take the job where they possibly can but but fracking I think it's you, you're obviously getting fracking up here are you because I know that they've they've just two miles down the road right because I know they've also passed it in in Yorkshire as well just yeah. not far south of Tancaster Beverly way to me it, it's it's got to be easy money isn't it there must be other ways of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're taking the 30 pieces of silver and, yeah. and uh, well, how can I say it, really, uh, to hell with the 
community. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, you look at free energy. There is there was obviously free energy out there. You know, with, so the, with all the, well the, the Tesla stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because there's no money in it, sadly. But the elementals will get it. We'll, 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 they'll, they'll work it. Yeah, keep the pressure up. Definitely. Keep the, uh, the, uh, the continuity of the, uh, the process caps going. Absolutely, and yeah. Pop down. Yeah, drop good for them, you. Drop them some food off, drop them some wood off for the show your support. You know. Yeah, well done. And say, just, just encourage the elementals down there as well. They will certainly help. Yeah, well, the, the people that are down there are sort of very much you know, sort of, uh, into the earth. Yeah, very much so. Into uh, not damaging the earth, be uh, kind to the earth. And yeah. So, yeah. Trouble is, you know, people can get sort of uh, charged over very easily, can't they? Really, they, they sit there a bit like years ago. Violent, passive. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's the way to go. Of course it is. But of course, it, it's if you can, if you can send love to the people that are doing it. You know, it's not worth fighting fire with fire with with anything. Mm. You know, if you can just sort of. Uh, try and transmute it by sending love, by sending peace, by sending happiness out. Hopefully something will get through. Hopefully. Mm. Yeah. We shall yeah. see. But yeah, keep up the good work with the wood. Yeah, well, I've got, I've got a large family, so when it's empty, I've got a bit of time. I'll, if, I, if I can get some timber or pallets and stuff, I'll yeah. drop it off. Take them down there. Brilliant. Anybody else? Yeah. Are you still doing anything about chemtrails? Hmm, yeah, chemtrails. You can, with a lot of these, there, there was a guy called Slim Sperling over in the States who did a lot of work um, with very intricate copper. Um, he would actually make some most amazing, whether they, whether they were spirals, different shapes, and he would then place them on the ground um, near airports under, you know, where, the, where aircraft would cross, and actually he could visibly see the chemtrails and the, 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 the contrails disappearing over, the, over that particular place. I think with them, the, the more that they are aware that we are here to ask them for their help, the more they will help doing it. Now, I suppose with all of this, it, it's, it's very difficult to know, is it part of the natural progression of the planet? Is it meant to happen? I personally don't think it is, and I think that you know, with HARP and all the other bits and pieces, um, whether they're look, I don't know, it, 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 it's... It's something, yes, you can do. A simple answer to the question is, yes, you can. <laughs> I get caught up in semantics. But yes, if you ask them to actually start working on the chemtrails, there's a very good chance they'll sort them out. Send healing, ask them up there to disperse whatever chemicals that might be out there in, a, in an appropriate way, take it into the universe, take it into the light, but ask that the chemtrails are, are, are taken away, dispersed appropriately, so that they are bringing no harm to human beings on the planet. Devices. Yeah, they work very, very similar to, to, to Slim's devices. I think with a lot of this stuff, it's amazing what we, in hu what, what we as human beings can do w with intent. But the difficulty is, because we are such busy people, it's actually very difficult to anchor intent 24-7. So this is what Slim was trying to do with his, with his copper wires and copper coils, so that he'd put his intent into them, and that's what they would do. And the same... What was it you just mentioned? Oh, organ generators and things. Is it the, the stuff inside it, or is it actually the, the intent that human beings have put into it? I've no idea. No, that's the problem. It's chicken and egg, isn't it? But you know, if, you, if you build something with, with the intent that it's actually going to do the planet some good, then it will do the planet a lot of good, and it's anchored your healing intent, it's anchored your goodness into it all. Um, but if you just put a, a piece of metal down here with, with no intent, it's a piece of metal. So I think with anything, you know, we, we've, we've got one in the book which is called um, an energy transporter, uh, which a friend of mine came up with a name, and it's a way of being able to sort of pin your intent. You know, if you want to actually put um, chemtrails on, on the absorb and elementals on, on the transmit, all the energy patterns that the, the elementals can transmit will then be absorbed into the, into the, con into the um, contrails and chemtrails up in the planet. Apparently, Kate Bush is the singer Kate Bush, her father, had uh, a device which was on one of her records called, called Cloud Buster. Right, okay. It was a, a Cloud Buster machine, and everyone thought it was a prop. Apparently, I don't know for sure, yep. but apparently it wasn't a prop, it was an actual machine that he made. It, was a work, it wasn't a it was a fully working model. Yeah, I've seen... Did the Victorians have them or something? They're, they're almost like his master's voice, wasn't it? With the big cone on the end. 
Yeah, the tubes. The tubes are very, very slight. Yeah. Um, you can cloud bust yourself quite easily if you, just, if you just sit down there or lie down there and just watch the clouds and actually just send your thoughts towards it to actually to bust it. Um, it can often happen. But again, it just shows you the intent. You've really got to focus to do it. But with a cloud busting machine, yeah, these things do work. Is it the right thing to do? Probably a bit of fun. But, you know, the clouds obviously bring water to the planet, which we desperately need. Um, but yeah, it can be done quite easily. Yeah, anything else? Adrian, with, the, um, with us now, the last 150 years, because you were saying that they like to interact with people. Yeah. Um, so for the last 150 years, we've moved into urban conurbation, mm -hmm. lost touch. And, so, why are the elementals still knocking about in cities and all that? When you know, do they miss the interaction, or they not asked? They do. They're there. You don't. Yeah. You. You don't find many of them in cities. You'll probably find them more in some of the some of the parks, like Hyde Park, whatever else. They'll be there. <clears throat> but a lot of people's when I'm working for, for people in London, um, I often tend to find no elementals at all in their gardens. And they will often complain, no wildlife, no, squ oh, no squirrels. Um, forget the squirrels for a minute, but no wildlife. No birds come in, no bees come in. Nothing comes into the garden that they, that they can see. And the same with, um, there's a friend of ours lives in Chorley, and then there's obviously been a lot of house building in Chorley on a lot of the old rubbish dumps. You've got the, all the methane chimneys in there. And Again, this, this friend of mine was complaining there were no squirrels, there were no birds, no bees, nothing comes into the garden. So I started talking to the elementals around, quite a few around, but stuck in the various trees and the shrubs miles away from anywhere, to actually encourage them to come into their house, come into the garden. And she phoned me back within two, she didn't know what I was doing, but within two days, squirrels, robins, thrush, you name it, were sort of coming to the bird table. It suddenly changed almost overnight. And the same with London as well. You've got plain trees, you've got some of the um, veg you know, vegetarian and veg vegetables and vegetation in people's gardens, but you do often need to call elementals in just to be able to help. But do they not miss the interaction with people? Yeah, 99.9% of the population yeah. are, not, are not aware of them, are not talking to them, not interacting with them. No, luckily there are a few people out there that do, um, and that kind of like just helps spread the word a wee bit. But yeah, they're, they're pretty hacked off with the human race. Um, you know, the leprechauns in Ireland, you know, there's some people who believe in them, but of course you look at these little green men charging around the place after you've had 10 pints of Guinness. Um, you know, it, it, they almost, be because they've become fairy tales, you know, almost that, that belief in something that lovely disappears. Children will believe in it, but then suddenly they become sceptical, and yeah, they, they just, they get very upset, the fact people aren't talking to them. Sadly. But the more you can, the word spreads very quickly and suddenly, yeah, there's a lot of people working for the light, if you like, and yeah, just stop talking to them, interacting with them, yeah, and the word does spread. You suddenly find people queuing up at the back door ready to come into the house, <laughs> which is not always a good idea. There was a, yeah. Uh, I was going to say earlier on, you mentioned about um, tree spirits and things like that. Yep. It could be in a, a plank of wood that maybe was put in your home. Would you just use dowsing to help the tree hmm. spirit go to a nice place, or, or are there other things that you could use? Yeah, to help move it. That's a good point. I was going to mention that, wasn't I? Um, the way I tend to do that, they want to be moved very, very gently. And um, I tend to find that, that any, any elementals in the house need to be moved on, whether they're sort of beneficial for the house or detrimental. They need to be outdoors. They need to be back out in nature, so to actually do what they do naturally. So. It depends. If you believe in archangels, if you believe in angels, the angels can come through and help move them. But what I tend to normally use is, <clears throat> excuse me, like an ultra-fine mesh net of light and love. So it's a very, very fine mesh net. It's like a trawler's net. I just tend to pull it through the house, asking that any trapped elementals in the house are just being picked up very gently into the net, and they're moved into a place of their choice, whether it's a wooded glade or whether it's down by, by the beck, wherever it may be that they need to be moved to that's actually beneficial for them and actually beneficial for the garden. And you can do that with, with a lot of dark energy in people's houses. These, because they're not... Um, that they, they don't mean to cause problems. By being trapped, it's like any of us, if you're sort of trapped in a cage or you're trapped in a house and can't get out for you know, X number of days, you're going to get pretty upset. So by just picking them up very, very gently and moving them back out into nature, and I always ask that they're, they're there then to look after the flora and fauna that they see around them, 
whether it's dedicating themselves to the trees, the birds, the bees, whatever else it may be. So once they're then gone, it's just to fill the house with light and love, just to make sure that there are no um, sort of, if you like, no pockets of, of, of energy, any residual energy left behind that might cause problems. So a net of light and love, fill the house with light and love, and it's sorted. Fairly simple. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? You know, some, you said some people can see elements. Yeah. Why is it that some people can and, and others can't? Sometimes I think it's belief patterns. Okay. The more you believe, the better the chances you have of seeing them. Um, I think, you know, because a lot of people over the years say, oh, fairies don't exist and, and gnomes don't exist and trolls don't exist. Um, you just, they just get shut out of your psyche. They do vibrate at a slightly lower level than we do. Whereas if in healing you're taught to raise your vibrations, when you're in nature it's quite nice to be able to lower your vibrations. As we were doing yesterday when we were walking up, up in, up in the, the dales, it's lovely just to be able to sit there sometimes and actually just plug into Mother Earth. So, you know, put your feet on the ground and imagine tentacles growing out of your feet down to a, either a lovely lump of rose quartz in the centre or a 24 carat bar of gold, whatever you need to anchor you to the, to the planet. And then just sit and see what you experience. But most people, um, they believe in things they can touch. They believe in computers, they believe in computer games, the news, <coughs> um, and all the stuff that's actually pushed their way. We've almost just lost touch with nature. So the more that we can believe, the better chances. You, if you can't see them, you can certainly feel them. You feel their presence. Okay? But I don't, I rarely ever see them. But I, sometimes, like, like, the, like the troll, I just got this impression, this kind of slight outline, of, like, a bit like a, a pencil drawing outline of him being there. So I thought, hmm, OK, right, better be careful on this one. OK, next? Any more? OK, yes? There's um, a mill in Bolton that I go to quite a bit. Uh, when you switch the lights out in the basement, on the CCTV, you can see just discs or like the orbs just floating around. Okay. So yeah, no, I think that you've so probably got. What those are. You've probably got elementals down there. I tend to find normally those sort of lights will be elementals more more than spirits. Um, spirits, you'll sometimes get a shadow drifting through, which probably you couldn't see in the dark. But I would say elementals down there, and uh, do they get things moved and misplaced? No, it's not too bad. Okay, because you'll sometimes find that things will be moved around the place and everybody's blaming everybody else, but no, the elementals will... They, they, they have a great sense of humour, slightly unusual sense of humour. Um, so I think that's probably more likely what it is rather than spirits. So which elementals are those? Be? You've got, certainly got some earth elementals down there. Any water? You've got some air elementals down there. Yeah, so, so you've got earth and, earth and air elementals down there. How would we get them out? Right, I would say that you, if you, yeah, 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 and it's quite a good thing to do because you don't always want unpaid house guests down there, do you? Um, do you have any problem with the alarms down there? That's all okay, is it? The alarms are no. Okay, so what I would do is just, you know, with, with that, just get the, um, the, this ultra fine mesh net of light and love and just pull it through the whole of the basement. Um, and through the, if you like, do it through the whole mill, just through the plumbing system, through the air system, um, just asking that any, detri any trapped or detrimental elementals there being picked up, get to the end of the mill, just say take it down to, into one of the local parks or outside Bolton in, into sort of a lovely green area and put them down there where, the, where they will start doing their work again with nature, with, with the flora and fauna, and then just see if that stops it. And it should do. Yeah. Okay. It sounds easy, and, and it kind of is. Once you get to know who they are, what they are, it's very, very easy to be able to move them on. So good luck with that. Okay. Are we just about done? Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you very much. This is a great question.